What's up guys? Welcome back to Newswave. A big day today. We find out all about the Dragon Quest XI sales over in Japan, along with Switch sales and 3DS sales, which, yes, they ended up being massive, as you would expect. So let's get started. And yes, the first thing up today is Media Create, where they tell us all about how things sold last week in Japan. Most of the time, I believe Media Create is all physical sales. I don't think they count anything through eShop or PlayStation Network stores. But let's take a look at the charts right now, and you will obviously see that Dragon Quest 11 for either the PS4 and the 3DS, both at the top as you would expect. The 3DS did sell more as I assumed it would. There are more 3DSs out there by a good margin compared to the PS4, so the fact that they were actually this close is pretty shocking to be honest. I thought the 3DS would have done much better than the PS4. It seems they were a lot closer here where the PS4 was at 950,000 and the 3DS version at 1.15 essentially million units. And that's that's pretty good overall. Splatoon 2 obviously Obviously had a bit of a drop off since, well, everybody bought it week one, but still 105,000 units. Now, I feel like this isn't surprising, right? Dragon Quest XI has always been popular in Japan. Always. I mean, it's <laughs> whenever a new one comes out, it sells well. The 3DS version uh, usually sells pretty well. I'm surprised, like I said, that it actually did not sell as much here. But, of course, the PS4 version probably took some of that away. I'm sure there are some people who have both, and they opted for the PS4 version over the 3DS version. But let's take a look at the hardware numbers. That's where things get a little interesting here. As you would expect, the 3DS... Uh, sales very high 142,600 3DS units sold last week obviously due to Dragon Quest 11 because the week before 34,145 also helps obviously that 2DS XL is out there now and that did sell very well by the way and but right below that the PS4 definitely picked up as well at 93,356 as opposed to the week prior at 30,000 or so the Nintendo Switch is surprising me here and let me tell you why. I was positive that last week there's big Splatoon 2 blowout was just that. I thought it was a blowout of stock. Like they put as much stock as they could out and that was it. And then we'd be down further this week in like the 30s or 40,000. No, 89,000 Nintendo Switches apparently sold that same week where there's no Dragon Quest XI on it, which tells me, wow, if uh, Dragon Quest XI makes it out later on this year, like they are saying it will on the Switch in Japan, and they have enough Switch units, they could sell well over 100,000, could even touch that 3DS number with Switches if they have that many. So this could be very interesting. And just because we enjoy keeping tabs on the Xbox One, it was up from 77 last week to 94. So they're coming up on that big three-digit number. Uh, hopefully Microsoft can get there before the end of the year. We'll see if it works out for them here. Now also, I want to check out the breakdown of system type. Let's move down to that chart where you will see the PS4 Pro sold 10,000, almost 11,000, 11,000 basically, as 11,000 units as opposed to 82,000 regular PS4s. That should be eye-opening to a lot of people as to, well, how much more popular the regular PS4 is than the PS4 Pro. I don't think it's surprising anyone though because obviously the PS4 is cheaper. In some cases it's way cheaper because you can get it for 250 now just about. And a lot of people, like I said, don't have 4K TV sets that they even need the Pro for. A lot of people are viewing that Pro as a half step and you can see here, Almost 1 in 10 uh, sold to the PS4 to Pro, uh, but they usually say it. I think that it's about a 1 to 4 ratio now. That is a very large difference there that I'm shocked about, to be honest. Uh, the new 2DS XL, doing really well. Called the 2DS LL there, by the way. 110,000 of that 142,000, all 2DS LLs. Uh, impressive, I, I will say that. Even the regular 2DS sold 3,600. That's very surprising. Um, and then, of course, the new 3DS LL there, 26,587, with just the new 3DS that I really like, by the way. I, I really like that new 3DS that's a little smaller, so the screen looks a little better. 1,300 units. So very, very good launch for Dragon Quest XI. It'll continue to sell, by the way. Next week, I'm sure they'll sell quite a few. And I believe 3DS sales will be up for a while now. And, and it's how we would expect, right? Dragon Quest XI does well there. I will be very, very curious curious to see how it does when it comes out west here to see if they can have a big sales day for that as well. Uh, it definitely won't sell anywhere near what it's doing here in Japan. It's just, it's always been popular there. Not as popular here in the States, for example, but people will still buy it. We'll still break a good number, I think, just because stuff seems to sell really well here in the States as opposed to other places. But it'll be interesting to see when it comes over here if it, the Switch version makes the jump with those other two. Because if they release Switch, PS4, 3DS all on the same time, I do think the Switch version is going to be up there in sales, depending on how many Switches are around, obviously, because that's going to be a big thing. Where the PS4 is very popular here, I do see the Switch version being better. Honestly, I think 
think the Switch version had been out here, it would have sold really well too, as long as the install size is better, obviously. The Switch version, if it is the PS4 version and it could be home and portable, I don't really know why I wouldn't buy that version. I mean, as long as it played well enough, yeah, why, why wouldn't I get that one? And to see the Switch sell as well as it has, I'm going to be very curious now. I said this last week, though. How is it going to do next week? Did Nintendo all of a sudden fix their supply issues where, hey, we found Flash Chip, guys. We made that deal. Get ready for, you know, 80,000 Switches every single week in Japan. And if, if, if they're getting that many, how many are we getting other places in the, in the, in the world? I mean, what, how many are we getting here in the States? I really want to see Nintendo's quarterly reports uh, when that ends uh, in the next month or so, and then we get the reports. I want to see where we are at that time, because that that could be a bigger number than I thought. 4.7 million at the end of June? I mean, where are we going to be uh, coming up on fall here? That's going to be very interesting. Next up, I want to jump over to Ubisoft, who is currently working, obviously, in tandem with Nintendo for the Mario Rabbids uh, XCOM-type game. That it looks pretty cool, by the way. I'm, I'm very excited to check that out. We'll be reviewing that here. But... They said some interesting stuff here that is really bugging me because they're saying stuff that's kind of teasing what I want on the Switch, which is South Park. I want South Park to make the jump to the Switch. I think a lot of people want that game to jump over, but it was running the Snowdrop engine, something a lot of people weren't sure how it would run on the Switch. Well, according to Ubisoft, it runs pretty well. So if you don't know, Ubisoft has been doing quite a few interviews now with different press sources, and we're going to talk about another bit that they did with Eurogamer, but here I want to talk about something that Andrea Babich said to N Tower about the Snowdrop engine. Actually, we were really surprised about how easy development for this system is. I don't want to sound like a Ubisoft or Nintendo fan, but when we got the dev kit and put the Snowdrop engine onto the Switch, these two perfectly fit together. The Snowdrop engine, which is our engine for almost everything and which we used for the last South Park game, is so versatile that we quickly lost our worries about the development. First of all, they just had to say South Park, didn't they? They just had to say, I, I want South Park on the Switch. I think that game would work perfectly as a portable game. And I think a lot of us were hoping that we would hear about some kind of Switch uh, port of the game. We still could down the road, right? It's not going to make launch, obviously, because that's coming up. But we can still hear about something maybe next year. And the fact that the Snowdrop engine works worked so well here on the Switch, where apparent, according to them, no issues. Why? Why not? <laughs> Bring it over. I want South Park on this system. I think you guys do too. And this is, uh, this is interesting because they like to develop a lot of their games going forward. They're going to use the Snowdrop engine. So uh, this could be a good partnership going forward for Ubisoft and Nintendo since their engine works really well apparently on the Switch. And while we're on the topic of Ubisoft, I want to point you guys over to a pretty cool video that I caught from Eurogamer. Very, very interesting concept here. Something I didn't think of and I don't think anyone really thought of is this point of view from developers when a game leaks. So Eurogamer sat down with two of the developers, one for obviously the composer uh, and Grant Kirkhope, and a the lead developer, the guy that we saw crying. Do you remember that? Where we, we they they jumped over to a picture of him, and he was obviously overwhelmed with emotion. I'm talking here about Davidid Salonini, and you could tell he was very emotional. But they brought up a very interesting, uh, I guess, an interesting point of view here to your gamer when your gamer asked them how did you feel when that game leaked because obviously when it was leaked guys i think a lot of us were kind of like wait what i mean at the time all we heard was there was going to be a mario and a rabbits crossover some kind of game and we were like hey, that sounds weird and then we hear it's an rpg and we're like what and then we hear we don't we're not going to be controlling our characters directly they were going to be following a disc shaped object and then we hear it might be kind of like a tactical based game like a strategy rpg and all this sounded so weird that at first a lot of people heard it and there was a lot of pushback and I never thought about this but they asked them and they start Devadid starts talking about how man it was tough because people in the offices were like is this gonna work like they were asking them so it actually kind of lowered the developer morale leading up to E3 because people were just like they were just beating this game down before we'd even seen it there's even a part in the video where Devadid talks about how Grant Kirkhope was sending him text messages like no no the game's good you you know it's good you, we have to go through with this. It's a good game. Don't worry. And then, of course, they get to the event. Uh, Miyamoto comes out. They show it. It looks good. Like, it looks like a solid tactical-based game. And he says that because of all kind of the negativity leading up to it, where people just weren't sure, that it made it that much better when Miyamoto comes out on stage, puts the game over big time. People were really excited about that. And, and it, it, that's one of the big things why he's talking about how there's just so much emotion because of that interesting point of view. I never thought about it that way, right? Where something leaks out, there's pushback from the public, and then developers who are out there actually making the games are like, I hope we're making the right 
game because obviously our livelihoods depend on this. If this game bombs, we're out of a job, so I hope this works. And I mean, in this case, I guess it did. I think a lot of people are going to buy it. I'm looking forward to trying it out later on this month. So uh, interesting point of view. I'll put the video link down in the description. Kind of a cool concept to really think about from their point of view. Never thought about that with the leaks. In our last bit of news, we're going to talk about Take Two's, uh, their financial quality did with investors, because there was some interesting news that came out. One that kind of caught my eye, and I think a lot of other people, it, apparently NBA 2K18 on the Switch is coming out digitally on day one with the other versions, but the physical version is going to come out later on, not on the same day according to them. So you'll see a graphic here, and you'll notice NBA 2K18, right below XCOM 2 to the right, you'll see that it has all the platforms launching September 19th, but the Switch, of course, has a condition next to it in parentheses in digital which is weird because below that, NBA 2K18 Switch Physical has just been moved to fall 2017, much like how WWE 2K18 has also had its date, instead of a, an exact date, moved to fall 2017 as well. And I think a lot of people saw this and they're like, wow, that's an odd thing to happen, right? I mean, what's, what's going on here? And honestly, I don't know. There's a few things I could kind of throw out there as maybe because, of course, the games are made up of flash chips inside. I mean, maybe either the manufacturing process is taking longer or that flash chip shortage that we heard about for Nintendo's, uh, the Nintendo Switches we're having issues with. Maybe the games are having issues too, where as the flash chip gets larger, it kind of kind of wanes in the territory where iPhone would have been interested in Apple. Because of course, if they're smaller games and it's like an 8 gig or a 16 gig, but Apple's not interested in that at all. All their Obviously, all their phones start at 32 gigabytes. So they don't care about eight or 16 cards. In this case, though, something like NBA 2K18 is going to be large, right? The last year's version was oh, almost 50 gigabytes. Even with compression and, and different things they do with the Switch, it might still top 30 gigabytes, and they might need a 32 gig flash chip, for example, to make this work. We'll know when they put the, when we at least get the store page and the digital version has a, a file size next to it. That might be it though, isn't that interesting? Because that could be affecting other things like WW2K18, which is also a big game. Maybe that's just the way the flash chip shortage is, hand is going right now. Maybe they just have to wait for chips to become available for them to even just print the game physically. I don't know, I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are. Do you think that is because of a shortage or do you think there's some other reason? Let me know in the comments. And the last thing to talk about from this Take Two conference call is interesting. Grand Theft Auto Online will not stop. It keeps making money. In fact, according to them, this quarter was the biggest amount of money that they have ever made in this game to date. So check this out. Take-Two's net sales for the quarter was $348.3 million, which is up 28% from the last quarter. 94% of that or 336.2 million came from backlog games, games that already exist. According to them, it was mostly Grand Theft Auto V and NBA 2K17. Which begs the question here, uh, these service-based games obviously are, are is like the way of the future for these companies, but does Grand Theft Auto Online actually have to be tethered to something like a Grand Theft Auto 5 or a Grand Theft Auto 6? Couldn't those come out and be like big, awesome mainline story-based games and they don't have to focus on the multiplayer at the time? Because of course when they're creating it, they're making both. Wouldn't it be better if they just made a Grand Theft Auto Online that you buy and they update it constantly with expansion packs or something so you don't have to keep buying the next Grand Theft Auto game. You can choose if you want the expansion. I mean, are we getting to that point now where they should just be separated if you don't want the main storyline for GTA? You don't have to buy it. You just buy into the online. I don't know because it seems like they love the online service. I don't blame them because it makes so much money. They can just sit on that all day and it and millions of dollars apparently come in for them. Take Two has to just absolutely love the way that Grand Theft Auto has gone so far. Go from something like Grand Theft Auto 3 on the PS2 to a service-based game like Grand Theft Auto 5. It is, it's insane. I don't know. I mean, I know they're working on GTA 6. It's obvious, but maybe GTA Online becomes its own thing. And that's it for News Wave today, guys. Make sure you comment, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Let me know think about any of the stuff we talked about today, whether it is the media create sales with the Switch actually still picking up a lot of steam, rolling forward, and Dragon Quest XI, and the 3DS making a massive resurgence this past week. Massive sales. It, it's, it really is amazing how well that thing still sells in 2017. Also, let me think about that, that interesting point of view from developer standpoint with leaks. I think that's kind of interesting to look at. I would have never thought sitting back in their office cubicles, looking online, seeing people like, what, Mario Rabbids? No one wants that. And here they are slaving away for 12, 13 hours a day trying to get this thing out. Interesting point of view. That's it for now, guys. I'll see you next time. <laughs>